available available on our uh, YouTube channel. So uh, welcome to Michael Moore Pogo. To say this is an honor is, is, is an absolutely tiny, tiny reflection on how I'm feeling right now. It's a joy to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. I've got all sorts of uh, comments coming in from uh, schools who are watching. Hello, Presswood Junior School. Hello, uh, Long Marston School. Um, I did forget to send Belinda the link. So apologies, Belinda. Uh, I know she's watching. Uh, Mrs. Clark shouts hello. I always like doing this, um, this bit at the start, because I think the children love being involved. I've got a load of questions from various schools and question, and I'd like questions to come through on the Q&A function. I can already see a few of you are already on it. Mrs. Clark's already on it and I see, see Long Marston on it. So get your questions in on, and please do credit the, ch um, credit the child who is asking the question. I can see um, Byron Court has just sent a load of questions in. Love to know who the children are who are asking them. Um, so without further ado, Michael, thank you so much. Ben, to... nice to meet you. And thank you for thank you for inviting me back to Hertfordshire, where Well, I was indeed. Let, let, well, let's cover that point off. You, uh, you were born somewhere local to here, weren't you? I was born in St Albans on the 5th of October 1943. And I grew up, my early, early days were spent in a place called Radlett. Um, and then later on, when I was at secondary school, I was in, near Watford. So I, I really am a Hertfordshire boy. Born and bred. Born and bred, love it. And um, so 43, your probably memory of, of the Second World War is fairly fairly small. It finished in 45, obviously. My memory of the war is, is nil. Uh, that's not quite true. I have one memory, which, you know how memories when they're very early, you're not quite sure whether someone else has told you this and you've remembered the story they told you or whether it was a real memory. But I do have my earliest sort of memory of there being a danger was being in a train with my mother, a steam train, of course, in those days, and a plane attacked the train. And I know if, I do remember everyone being on the floor of the train. And then um, then it was very dark and we were in a tunnel and everyone was crying. That's all I remember, really. of it. And I don't even think that's a proper memory. I think because I'm a storyteller, I probably was told it by my mum or by someone and then and then um, built it up. I tell you what I do have a memory of, that is what, what happened afterwards. And that, that really is, a, how should I say, the inspiration of so many of the books that I've written. Absolutely. I mean, the England and the UK, it was a tough place to live, wasn't it, in those first years? There was um, a lot of... Well, it's an interesting thing, Ben, how we're, the echo of those times is really going on today. A bit. I mean, the adults have lived through six years of trauma and, you know, the losses were huge. We, 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 we're, we are looking at the moment terrible losses from the pandemic um, and sadness and grieving all over the place and everyone really understanding that this is a dreadful time we're going through. Well, they went through it for six years. And uh, so that when I was growing up, the atmosphere, um, it wasn't just called post-war, it was post-war. And so the, the rationing went on. So I grew up with rationing books and I grew up with people crying a lot um, in my house because I lost an uncle. When I say I lost an uncle, I didn't lose an uncle. I never met this uncle. He was a photograph on the, mm. on the mantelpiece. But my mother's brother, Peter, was killed in the RAF. And there was sorrowing, sorrowing through the land, really. And it went on, it echoed on. And of course, there was considerable loss of jobs. The economy was in ruins. The place was in ruins. I played in bomb sites. I went to school where there was a bomb site next door. It, it just echoed on and echoed on. And I think the effect on me was huge, and as it will be with this pandemic, you know, children living the last, through the last 15 months, shut up in their flats and looking out of the window and how that was and how the adults around them behaved and how they missed their friends. All this stuff won't leave them. This will be part of um, their lives. And we have to make sense of those early, those early difficulties that we go through. And my difficulties were nothing as compared to many people in that war and many people now, but nonetheless, we. We lived through it, came out the other side. And it, it matters to me to remember those things. Absolutely. And you, you most definitely made sense of it through your through your writing. And um, but you came to writing um, sort of later than than I realised, actually. I didn't realise um, um, you, you went into teaching first. Is that correct? No, I went into the army first. Um, I left school and went into the army. Um, um, and I, I, I made my best friends ever in the army and I kind of understood it and got it, but I made up my mind rather quickly not to spend the rest of my life doing it. And that was a story, again, I was on exercise and in, in, I was at Sandhurst 
trying to become a soldier. And they sent us out on, on a wintry exercise uh, in 1963. And it was the hardest winter I think we've ever had. And we were in slip trenches and it was snowing and the, there was a pretend enemy. Um, I think they were called the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders opposite us. And they shouting horrible things at us through the night. And we didn't really like it very much. And I remember sitting in my slit trench and looking out over the snow, remembering the story of the Christmas truce in 1914. And it was the closest I ever got to such a thing and remembering really what happened then and the dreadful war that followed that in 1914. And I thought, well, do I want to spend the rest of my life doing this? Probably not, because I suppose I was already then keener on trying to find ways of making peace between peoples. So I came up um, and it, informed me and helped me a lot. I knew what comradeship was, I knew what trust was. When I left then I knew I knew so much more than when I when I went in. So I don't regret it one little bit. Yeah, but then I would find myself in a class facing 35 year sixes. Well it's much even worse than the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, I can tell you. Um, it, it was you have to you have to be brave to be a teacher. Most people don't know this. But um, facing children, what are you doing? You're educating them, you're entertaining them you're comforting them, you're doing all these things at the same time. It is the most extraordinary job, and to my mind, the most as important, certainly, as medicine, that's for sure. And um, so, I, yes, I spent eight years at the coalface, teaching mostly uh, sixes, um, or trying to teach them. And I, I ran a football team, um, and I was really a bad football coach. Um, the, the, the last time my team ever played, this is in Canterbury, near there, the score was the village next door was called Littlebourne and my village was called Wickhambrew and the score was at the end of the game uh, Littlebourne 12, Wickhambrew nil. So my time as a football coach uh, was to be brief but then yes so I changed job. I didn't actually change job, I changed place. I moved from school and took classroom to a farm in the middle of Devon and we've been for the last Ah, nearly 50 years now, having children from cities tell and us, towns. Yeah, tell us about the farm. Yeah. It's, um, it's a remarkable Yeah, place. It's, called, it's a charity my wife set up called Farms for City Children. And the idea really was this, and teachers listening will understand, and the kids will too, is that you can't learn everything in a school. You can learn a heck of a lot in a school, particularly if you've got a great teacher in a great school, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's good to go outside the school, to introduce children to the wider world out there. And of course, the countryside is part of their world. So just because you don't live in it doesn't mean it's not yours. It's where their food comes from. And these days, it's the contact they have with nature, which is important. So we decided, no, let, let's um, set up an organization where kids can come for a week. Uh, and they'll, we're there pri from primary schools and they'll live and work on a farm, 35 at a time, stay in a big house, which looked like Hogwarts, and they'll live in this place. And um, they'll live there for a week and, and be farmers for a week. And that's what we've been doing. We've now had 100,000 children um, come down to the farms, three farms we've got now. But the sad thing, Ben, is that uh, just like everyone else during the pandemic, we had to close down um, 15, 16 months ago and haven't been able to have children. And it's so sad. I mean, we, I think we all know this. It's what we miss that's been so, so dreadful for us. And in my case, I live in a lovely place. It couldn't be a lovelier place down a little Devon Lane with fields all around and woods and a river running by. Very famous river where Talk of the Otter was written. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the most... It's more, more like a paradise than really anything else. But however, in a pandemic, it's not a paradise. And it wasn't a paradise for us because we were used to all our working lives, really, to having children. Yeah. You know, yeah, we had cows, we had sheep, we had pigs, we had horses, we had donkeys, and we had children. And the children used to come and be there outside. If we'd hear them in the field, I'd be working with them, feeding the sheep and going out, checking this and checking that. That's what I did with my life. And suddenly there were no child, children's voices, no teachers, and we miss them. So we're longing for people to come back in the autumn time. So if any schools are listening and they're thinking, hang on, wouldn't that be fun? Get in contact, we'd love to see you. And I'd really love to have some Hertfordshire schools, for goodness sake, what's the point of being born somewhere if we can't take advantage of it? Please tell me some of the schools watching have been down to visit you. I, I really hope that's good. We've got about 30, 30 odd schools watching and uh, I, I can guarantee they'd all be jumping at the chance to come down to oh, It'd be lovely, it'd be wonderful. Right, teachers, make it happen. And, um, and uh, yes. So we're getting stacks of questions. Uh, they're already coming in in droves. And um, let me let me bring you on to uh, writing. What what made you get into writing first? Because uh, there's so many of the questions coming in are related to your books. Well, children. I mean, I was the you know, I was this year six teacher. I had this wonderful head teacher, wonderful head teacher called Mrs. Skiffington, 
And Mrs. Givington, um, she was eccentric and she, <laughs> she went one morning, she came in, into the staff room and she said, I had an idea in the bath last night. So we knew something was coming and she said, well, look, I've been teaching all these years and I'm here to tell you that children learn nothing from three o'clock onwards. They're too tired. And I'm here to tell you something else. Teachers can't teach after three o'clock. They're too tired. So why are we doing it? So I want every single teacher in the school to read a story they love to their class. And she wagged her finger and said, and do not ask them comprehension questions. Just read the story, let them walk out, go home with the story in their head and then go on with it the next afternoon, the next afternoon. Oh, and it's just something I'd so love to see done all over the country because it really worked. It was the part of the day I look forward to most. It was the part of the day they look forward to most. And a lot of them loved writing themselves as a result of making up stories. So that's why I, I ran out one day of a, a story I was telling wasn't working. I thought it was a pretty good story, but they didn't seem to like it. And you always know as a teacher when children don't like things, you know, there's certain signs like looking out the window or picking their noses or whatever. They just do not pay attention. And there's no point in saying pay attention, children. That doesn't work either. So I went home to my wife, who's also a teacher. And so what am I going to do? I started this book and they didn't like it. And what am I going to do tomorrow? And she said, well, don't go in there and bore them again. The worst thing you could do possibly is to bore children. Don't do it. So I said, well, what do I do? What do I do? She said, make one up. You're a pretty good liar. Tell a story, for goodness sake, <laughs> and tell it as if you believe it. I've heard you do this with our children. You, you tell stories and you're good at it. Do it, do it. I said, I can't. There's 35 little monsters. They'll kill me. And she said, no, no, you be brave, be brave. So I tried being brave. The next afternoon at three o'clock, I I'd laid awake all night, made up the story in my head and I tried very stutteringly to start with tentatively trying to make it work and I saw it wasn't working for the first five or ten minutes and then I don't know what it was but I just got into a gear and the gear was stop being a teacher in front of the children in a classroom live the story live it in your head as you speak it and they'll believe it it just came to me in a flash to stop stop pretending just do it as if you mean it. So I did it. And five minutes later, all their mouths were open and they were eating out of my hand. It was the best time of my life. And I was so enthusiastic about the story, I couldn't finish it. And the bell went. And they all said, oh, sir. So we went on the next day and the next day. And that's how I became a writer, purely to keep children quiet at three o'clock in the afternoon. Well, the, the question screening in my head is, what was the story? Did, did that become a book or is that? Oh, yeah, no, it did. It became a book. It's called It Never Rained. It was published by uh, Macmillan purely because the head teacher came in at the end of the first week of doing this and said, oh, Michael, I've heard, I've heard about your story that children are talking about in the playground. And I said, can I, she said, can I sit at the back? So she sat at the back and she liked it. And she said, look, I've got a friend who works at Macmillan Publishing Company. I like that story. Um, can we send it off? So we sent it off and I got a letter and I've still got this letter. It said, dear Mr. Morpingo or Gergo or something, no one can spell the name. Um, we just read your story. It's very good. Could you write five more? Five more. And here was the best line. And we will pay you 75 pounds. And I'm thinking, this is great to get paid for something you like doing, you know? And I think that's, that's really how it began. And then, and everyone knows this, once you've found something you like doing, whatever it is, you want to go on doing it. You want to go on doing it. There are many, many children here who found that they like painting pictures or they like playing football or they like this then you want to go on doing it and there are teachers who love teaching that's why they go on doing it they don't do it because they hate it they do it because they love it and that's what I found I love doing this thing and it's uh, I just became a storyteller by accident I've made a note of it never rained I'm going to search that one up so uh, um, and um, the, 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 the book that is your is the definitive one which i mean obviously a lot of children are well aware of and will be asking about is, is obviously warhorse um what's the background to, to to that how did you um come up with the idea for, for warhorse well it, it's interesting you see i never come up with an idea ideas always come to me and i think it's for me all writers are different but for me there has to be something that happens to me something that i'm told something i see something i witness something i read about which, they, yeah, that, that's really interesting. And then I ask some more questions around it and bit by bit by bit weave together, not the tale just to start with, just how it was in that particular situation. So with Warhorse, to be specific about it, where I'm speaking to you from is from a little village called Iddersley in the middle of Devon, where we've been living to do this Farms for City Children project, which is just down the road. But in the village about a mile away, 
There's a pub called the Duke of York, also very good. I wouldn't advise all the children to come to it, but it's a very, very lovely pub. We had moved in here about 50 years ago, and I was told when I had arrived, I needed just a conversation with someone, um, that there's only 80 people living in the village, and three of them, this person told me, um, had been soldiers in the First World War. Now, we're talking about a long, long time ago. So they were still alive, these people. There's none left now. And um, I thought that was interesting, but not particularly interesting. And then I walked into the pub one day, and there was one of them sitting there by the fire with a, some beer in his, uh, in a pot in his hand. And I recognised him. He's called Wilf Ellis. I said, morning, Wilf, how are you? He said, fine. And I sat down with him and a drink. And I didn't know what to say to him, because he's an old bloke, and I was a young bloke in those days, and I didn't know him, really. The only thing I knew about him is he'd been to the First World War. So I said, Wilf, you, I heard you went to the First World War. He said, yep. And then he said, nothing else. And it, they're like that a bit down here. They don't actually uh, talk a great deal unless they really want to. And he didn't know me from Adam. So I said, how old were you? And he said, 17. And then he went on. He said a sentence which almost changed my life, did change my life. He said, I was there with horses. So I said, what do you mean you were there with horses? He said, I was in cavalry, Devon Yeomanry. And then this man just, just talked. I was there for, an, oh, for at least three beers, an hour and a half, sitting there in front of the fire, listening to this man uh, talk. I never interrupted him once. He wasn't sentimental. He just told me what it was like to be 17, to live, leave, leave this place and go to a country he'd never been to, fight against a people called the Germans. He'd never even met one, had no argument with them at all. It all none of it made any sense. There's a wonderful song in the First World War, which, is, which epitomized really what he was saying. The song goes, we're here because we're here because we're here because we're here we're here because we're here because we're here because we're he didn't know what he was there for at all and he told me about how it was to be 17 and in the trenches he told me how it was to be wounded he had his life spared by a german because he'd been gassed and he was just lying there at the bottom of the trench and this fellow with his bayonet out and he thought well this is it it wasn't just the guy just turned around and walked away there's no idea why at all. He kept telling me these things. And the one thing that stuck in my mind that I immediately was very touched by, he says, you know, I couldn't talk to my friends about anything that really mattered. My fear, my longing for home, my mum, all the things I want to talk about, I couldn't talk about because everyone was missing them and you didn't talk about those things because it made you teary and you didn't want to do it. So do you know who I talked to? He said, I talked to my horse. And he would go to the horse lines at night and feeding the horse and watering the horse and and he said, I put my hand on, I put my hand on the horse's neck. He said, it felt, felt like warm velvet. And he said, and I tell that horse everything that mattered to me. He's my best friend. And I, he said, I'm not being silly. He was my best friend at all. So I thought, that's an idea. Because I know there's lots of stories and poems and films made about war and the First World War. But I'd never found one in the First World War, which was from all sides. It's always on one side, German, French, British, American, whatever. Here, I thought I could have a neutral observer. I could have a horse which could be grow up here where I'm, where I'm living now, grow up on the farm here, could be sold away, bought by the British cavalry. So a British cavalry horse taken across to France, captured by the Germans, becomes a German artillery horse, an ambulance horse, winters on a French farm um, amongst civilians. So you see the war from all sides and and I thought, well, then, it, then it's a different sort of story. Yes, it's about a horse and a boy, but it's also about the universal suffering that goes on in all wars, that it isn't a one-sided thing, that everyone suffers, including the civilians in these days, of course, more civilians than almost anyone else. So I thought it's worth writing. So that's why I did it. Wonderful, wonderful. And what, what a, a remarkable story. Um, let's start introducing a few questions from the children. And... Um, there was actually, okay. I saw one from uh, Olivia, um, uh, it's from Mrs. Clark's class. Um, how long did it take you to write War Horse? Was it, once you'd had the idea, was it a very quick writing process? Olivia, I'm, um, I'm an extremely quick writer once I get going, but I spend a lot of time, and I call it my dream time, not writing at all. And most writers do, I think. Um, and actually, for me, it's the really important time. That's the time when you 
and try to try to live the story in your head without writing a word. So you'll have to read some history around it. You'll go to places. So I went to France, I went to Belgium. I, of course, live amongst horses anyway, that was taken care of. And I live in the countryside where Joey, the horse from your horse was born. So I had local, like I had local history and I could touch on all the time. Um, and so that took time. That all, I don't know what it took, six months, a year. I really can't remember, but I do bury myself in the story around the story because I feel things weave into the story and enrich it. And then there comes a moment when, yeah, you've got to sit down and do it. And every writer that's ever been, from Roald Dahl to Shakespeare to you, Olivia, you have to sit down and there's an empty page, or these days an empty screen, and you have to begin. And you have to write down your equivalent of once upon a time. And in my case, it was once upon a time there was a horse. And because you've been thinking about it, then the story starts telling itself. That, that, that's, that's the way I do it. And then I write really fast. I must write anything between 1,000 and 2,500 words a day. Um, and I count them because I like to know what I've achieved. And in a way, quite I've always been, the, the child in me likes to know what I've done. And I feel much better if I know I've written lots of words and not just one or two words. I mean, I'm writing a, a screenplay at the moment for, for a film. And I set myself the task of never going to bed without having written three or four more scenes. And some of them, of course, are very short, in which case I get away with it. But uh, other times they're really complicated. And then, uh, but both, I never write more than three. It, that's what you're doing. Don't rush it, don't rush it. And dream it up in between miles and let it take you off in directions that you haven't thought of. And therefore the person watching the film won't have uh, thought of as well. So yeah, I'm very, very fast when I start, but I'm a very slow starter. A question, that's a lovely, lovely response. Thank you. Um, a question from Byron Court Primary. They just sent me a long list of eight questions. So I'm going to ask one of those. Um, what tips do you have uh, for, for, for someone who wants to write a book? Um, it's really difficult because when you start giving tips, it sounds as if you're telling people this is the way to do it. There is no one way to do it. Every writer does it differently. My way is. Um, First of all, it, it, I suppose it is something which is really important for all writers, and that is you keep your eyes open, you keep your ears open, you even keep your nose open. All your senses must be open, and you must keep yourself open to the world. So you drink in the world around you, you read other people's books, you see films, you, do, you fill your head with the world around you and the stories about the world around you, stories that have been written thousands of years ago or those that were written yesterday. You read everything you can from the back of a cornflakes packet to um you know Tolkien to the hobbit you just read everything you possibly can because the great thing is to have your heads really used to words the words are going to be the key to this thing so then what i do is i find a story rather like meeting that man at a pub or in the case with kensky's kingdom which some of you i may have read um a story i read about a japanese uh, soldier left behind on an island in the pacific after the Second World War, only discovered nearly 30 years later. So you read that and then you, 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 you gradually, gradually let the thing build up until you are ready to tell it. And here's the thing I will give advice. When you do start writing, forget that you're writing a story. Tell it, tell the story from your head where the dream time has been, down your arm, through your fingers, onto the page or onto your computer, whatever you're doing, but tell it, don't write it. And here's the other thing. And most of the teachers, I think, would agree with this. I'm not talking about a school exercise here. I'm talking about writing. And it's writing that's really important most of the time. Do not let the anxiety, the worry of writing, stop you. In other words, don't worry about the spelling to start with. To start with, don't worry about the punctuation. Don't worry about the handwriting. Don't worry about anything except telling the story down. Then read it out aloud, one page, two pages, whatever you've written, read out aloud and make some corrections. When you've done those corrections, then, 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 write it out more neatly. Then do the punctuation. Then look up a spelling or two if you're not sure of it. But don't let the problems of the words um, interrupt your story. And last hint, I'll just, then I'll shut up about it, is this. Writing is a habit and I've got it badly. And the reason I've got it is because I try to write just two or three lines a day of something that I've seen or heard, whatever it's going to be. This morning, for instance, I'll give you, I was sitting at breakfast and a swallow 
came swooping down and is starting to make, make a, nest, a nest just above our window. And it sat there looking at me, its little black head and its little scarlet chest looking at me. And I was looking at the swallow and the swallow was looking at me. It was just a moment. So this evening before I go to bed, I'm gonna write just two lines, two lines, that's all, not hard. Describing that swallow and what a moment it was, what a thrill it was and all the rest of it. Not show it to anyone, it's all private and stuff, but you fill up books with these notes. And I'll tell you what that does, it means that writing becomes natural, as natural as speaking. You're just putting it on and that's it. And take the anxiety out of it. Fear is a writer's worst enemy. Very good. Um, oof, God, so many questions. Honestly, I have got pages of them. Let's, let's pick one at random. Um, so Ritaj uh, from 6ZB, and I don't know which school that is, but um, who was your favourite author when you were younger? Ritaj, I, um, I had two favourite authors. Um, one was because the books were really easy to read and I like easy reading because I think I was a bit lazy. Um, and that was someone called Enid Blyton, you probably heard of. And the thing I liked about Enid Blyton was that you turn the pages almost as quickly as you could eat a box of chocolates. You just turned it and at each page there was a new adventure almost. Uh, at the end of it, I never thought about it afterwards, to be honest with you. I just wanted another one. I said, like a box of chocolates, you understand what I'm saying? The first author I really knew was great was a man called Robert Louis Stevenson. And when I was 10, I read a book called Treasure Island. Um, it, it, the language is a bit antique because it was written a long, long time ago. But it was the first time I'd ever read a book where I felt I was inside the story. As a boy in it, it was exactly sort of my age at the time. It was called Jim Hawkins. And he, he gets on this ship with what he thinks are a bunch of good guys. And part, some of the good guys are, in fact, pirates. And he only discovers this when he's up on deck one night and he's going to take an apple from the apple barrel and he climbs into this apple barrel on the deck. And he's in there when all these people gather around, one of them being Long John Silver, he, who he thought was really a, an interesting good chap and fun and all the rest of it. He turns out to be the nastiest and most cutthroat pirate there ever was. He's going to take over the ship. And he hears all this from inside a barrel of apples. I was inside that barrel of apples. I was Jim Hawkins. And I've never, never known a book as exciting as that. It's what I, every time I write, start writing a book, I keep saying to myself, try and make it as exciting as Treasure Island. Very good. Now, listen, this, um, we've got about just over 15 minutes left. I did promise as part of this event, it's obviously at Warhorse is, um, uh, is the one, possibly the one that all the children know the best because it's been made into a film. Incidentally, did you do the screenplay for the film as well? No, I didn't. And I wish I had that. No one asked me. I agree. No. I agree, I, actually. <laughs> I, I tell you, it was the great thing was it was made into a wonderful play, first of all, at the National Theatre, uh, which was extraordinary and wonderful and unique. The film is fine, um, but I, I would like to have had the chance of writing the script, that's for sure. I will have say you, no more. Have you told Spielberg that? No, because I'm a coward. <laughs> well, do you know what? I'm going to tell him, because I think, I think you're right. Um, however, the follow-up, to War Horse, um, yes. and there was a sequel, was, was Farm Boy, and I yeah. saw this as a play at the Edinburgh Festival, and honestly, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite so uh, emotional and wonderful uh, as, as a yeah. piece of theatre. Two actors, a tractor, and yes. very simple, and absolutely gorgeous. I remember it, yeah. Were you involved in the play? Uh, I was involved a little bit, not much. I went to meet them um, and talk to them about the story. It's in a way, it's very hard when you've originated something. It's really lovely to be part of the process early on. And sometimes, yes, write the script. But I've often found that if you've got a theatre company or a film company that really seems to get the spirit of it, then it's best to back away and, and let them do it. Um, and I, I'm, a, I'm disappointed very often. But with Farm Boy, I most certainly wasn't. You're quite right. There was a wonderful simplicity about it. And the main character, of course, was a tractor. Um, which is rather important to the whole story. It's funny, it's not really a sequel, is it? I don't do sequels. I, I wanted to write a story in which the story of Joey, um, it was continued somehow. Actually, strange enough, this is a story of Farm Boy about a man, a wonderful old man who lived down the lane here. He wasn't my grandpa, he was called Sean Rafferty and he was a poet. And he worked in the vegetable garden here with the, where the children came, came to. And he loved the countryside. He, he was... Um, a man of words. So I put him in this book as a man who couldn't write. 
and is taught to write by his grandson. And this tractor comes into it. And of course, the life of Joey comes into it. And it's really the story of what happened to Joey uh, after he comes back from, from that dreadful war, which, which, which he does at the end of Warhols. I, I, it, I've never written a book so much set in my place. I look outside the window and I can see every picture of Michael Foreman's in either in my mind's eye, but always in these fields around here, in all seasons. You see it in summer, you see it in winter. He's done a wonderful, wonderful job of it. So yeah, I'm very fond of it. <laughs> There's a winter shot. Yeah. It's, it's uh, maybe my favorite book, I think, really, because it's about home, you know, it's a home book. It's, it's I mean, it's most definitely, I've, I've inhaled a, a few of your books in, um, in preparation for this. And uh, I have to say, Private Peaceful comes a very close second. Um, yeah. But uh, Farm Boy remains my favourite. It's just yeah. the most beautiful piece of literature. Ben, you have wonderful taste, like me. <laughs> I noticed you talked about the, um, the the German saving the life of the person. That obviously features in Private Peaceful, Peaceful as well, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. It, it features actually the first book I ever wrote about war, which was called Friend or Foe. Um, that, that happens a lot. I mean, essentially, there's a lot of books my, are about war, but they're mostly about peace, if people bother to read them. It's they're mostly about reconciliation uh, and it goes the other way around. I wrote, I wrote a, a book called Elephant in the Garden, which is the story of the bombing of Dresden by us uh, and the killing of 30,000 people uh, in the most dreadful raids. And again, we, we spent we, we spent so much time looking at history from our point of view. And I felt it was very important to do the other thing, to look from the other way and see what it felt like to be on the on the other side. I think all these years later, that's something we must do. I mean, after all, it's very interesting at the moment. I know it's good to bring in something that's happening now. We're having this football and all those countries we're seeing are either erstwhile friends during that war or erstwhile enemies. And look at us, 50 years later, more than that, 70 years later, whatever it is, we're playing football with each other and it's fine. There was no need for this stuff to happen in the first place. And that's what's really interesting, I think, is that we are living in an age now where we long for peace to go on. Um, these people ha um, didn't have peace and th they had to live through the horrors. I, I, you know, I'm watching the football, obviously a big game tonight for England, but you, you, you're watching every game with a level of perspective, having been through what we have been over the last yes. you know, year and a half. Yeah, um, absolutely. There are more important things in the world rather than football. So it's, there just are. A, We've, it's wonderful yeah. to be able to watch a game like that. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Reeve has uh, put in a question. Um, what would have been your dream job as a child? Did you know of such thing as being an author? Oh, no. Um, Mrs. Reeve, how nice to meet you. I'm presuming you're not a child. I'm presuming you're a teacher. Um, I suspect this question has <laughs> come from a child, but she is the messenger. So uh, I'm, very, very, than... I'm very perceptive about these things. Hello, Mrs. Reeve. Nice to, nice to meet you. Um, I don't know. I, growing up, I was a boy boy, that's for sure. And I really wasn't interested in books much. Um, I wasn't interested in my studies much. I shouldn't be saying this. I like play out. That's why I like to play out, climb trees, do that sort of thing. However, my first real ambition in life um, was that um, I wanted to play rugby for England. I wanted to pull on that white shirt with a rose on it. And I wanted to trot out on a, on a rugby ground called Twickenham. And I wanted to beat the hell out of either France or Scotland or Wales. I mean, I was a horrible little boy, but I loved rugby. So when I was growing up, I really wanted to, that's my ambition, play rugby for England. I dropped that when I discovered really I wasn't that good at rugby anyway. And um, then, then I, as I told you, I went to be a soldier, which I quite liked because it meant dressing up and I looked good in a uniform. Left that after a bit and then did what you do, Mrs. Reeve. I became a teacher. And I have to say, I found my, as they say in French, métier. I loved teaching. I, th I didn't like the staff room at all, but I did like um, teaching in the classroom and doing sports and things with the children. So I, I really, I think I'm still a teacher at heart. I'm a child at heart. And I think actually most teachers are as well, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. Mm. I, I was emailed a load of questions from various schools and I have to apologize to all of so many people whose questions are not gonna be asked. Uh, there was one that made me laugh, though. It made me laugh. It's um, a question from Horridge and Cholesbury. Mrs. Walker um, sent it in. And uh, amongst a plethora of other questions, there's one saying, why are your books so sad? That's a really good question and deserves a serious answer. So, did you say it was Horace who wrote in? Horridge and Cholesbury School. 
listen, um, yeah, I'm afraid it's, if you ask a, a question about sadness, you're going to get a serious answer. The truth is, as you know, everyone watching this, that life can be joyful and it can be sad. When you're writing, you have to write truth. You don't write to fool people. That's the silly lightheaded stuff. You know, I, I can do that. I was a good liar. I told you that. But in a sense, there's a deeper truth. We all find out the truth that matters to us. And um, I write about what I care about. And what I care about very often are the things that are wrong with this world. That is the suffering that goes on, the refugees, the wars, the, the difficulties that we all live through. Now, there was a time when I was little when children were protected for all that because there was no, there was no phones, there was no television. You, you just listened to children's radio and your parents told you what they wanted you to hear and nothing more. It ain't like that anymore. Children growing up today are much more sophisticated. They have a view of the world very, very young, which they can access. So if you're writing stories that you want them to read, you cannot patronize them. You can't say, oh, you sweet little things. I don't want to upset you. Excuse me, they're upset already. Every child listening to this, watching this, has had sadness in her or his life. All the teachers have too. So in books, you have to deal with both, the joys and the sadness. I'll tell you what I do try to do. I try to, at the end of my stories, if I can, always to find something positive to say, even in a book as dark and difficult as Private Peaceful. If you read the last line of Private Peaceful, it, there's hope in it. And I think hope at the end of a story is really, really important because I'm a firm believer that I'm an optimist. I think things are going to get better, but you have to live through difficulty. And all the children know that. I'm not telling them anything they don't know. In other words, what I'm saying to you is crying is as important as laughing. Oh, I feel I'm, I'm welling up but, but now myself. That's, that's a very, very lovely answer. Um, uh, Mrs. Meyer's class have asked, apart from your writing, uh, do you have any other hobbies? Um, but it's interesting you say that during the pandemic, um, I, I always liked the countryside and going out, but I've walked more than I've ever walked in my life before. Um, it sounds very boring, but it's always the same walk. And that sounds boring, except if you came with me, it wouldn't be boring. I mean, I go out through a field of sheep, down towards a wood where there are, if you're careful, you can spot deer down by the stream. I walk through this wood past badger holes, and I've seen badgers frequently down there. I come out into another field, down to a muddy old gateway that I have to tread through and be wellies without me wellies getting sucked off. I get down to the river and I see herons rising off the river. Sometimes I'll see a salmon jump. Sometimes I see otter footprints and I'll walk along, along, along and then up through uh, a long, long avenue of trees back home. It's about 40 minutes, something like that. But every day I see something different. So my hobby at the moment, honestly, is living deep in this countryside and and getting to know it so much better than I've ever known it before. In a way, I'm really grateful for this pandemic. It's stopped me from running around the place and endlessly thinking I've got to do this, I've got to do that. To sit, not to sit back and do nothing, but to just take stock, to do a lot of thinking. And it's interesting, I've been married for 57 years now, which is quite a long time. I've been very lucky that I've got someone who I love living with. And I thought, no, this is gonna be really difficult. I'm going to have a year in this house with you and I'm not going out. I've been shopping twice in 15 months. We're so well looked after by neighbours because everyone thinks we're very old. So they look after us. They're really sweet. And I was thinking at the beginning, what, what are we going to talk about? You know, and as the months went by and it didn't look as if we we're ever going to open up. But what I've learned is there's more to find out about her than I thought. And it's been really wonderful. It's, it's a life enriching time because it's been so serious, you know? Um, and I lost, you know, everyone again watching will know there's been tragedy fairly close to them. I lost my best university friend in a nursing home through this thing. And you, it, it, it fills you with a sense of how important life is, you know, and how important people are. I had a godmother, I'll tell you this, because it's a really important, a lovely lady called Mary Niven, who sadly is no more, but she told me last time I saw her, um, she would always, um, wag her finger at me and say something really wise and the last thing she said to me at the door of her home in her nursing home she said remember michael she was a scottish lady um remember that everyone matters <laughs> boom <laughs> very good
Very good. Uh, Elsa from Dundale would like to know, uh, and uh, I can totally understand you've lost count. How many books have you written in total? What was the name of this person? Elsa. Elsa. Um, if this it's is the a good same question. Elsa who came in the shop on Saturday, because Elsa oh. name of my, uh, was the name of my first dog, and uh, I've oh, had right. a chat with her. I mean, it probably is, actually, but anyway. All right. Um, listen, numbers of books, Elsa. Let me tell you what I think about numbers of books. What really matters about a book is that you like it, that you remember it, that it becomes a some, somehow part of your life that you're very fond of. And maybe you want to go back and read it. It doesn't matter. Two things don't matter. It doesn't matter how many an author has written. And I'll tell you something else that doesn't matter in the end. It doesn't matter who wrote it. In the end, this book has a life of its own. I'll, I'll explain what I mean to you, else, and it's this. If I write a book, okay, yes, I sit down and I do the writing. But you are the person who will take that book, open it up, and bring your mind and your heart to that story, and you make it live inside you. Without you, there is no story. It, look, the book closes. That's it. It takes the reader to open it up, open it up, read the story, and suddenly this story becomes part of you. How many of these books you write or sell, people go, and go on endlessly about bestseller. You know, what's that for? It's just to get you to buy the next book. You know perfectly well what really matters is the book. So don't worry about the numbers. My people who, um, my publishers tell me I've written about 150 books. But here's the thing. I know of those 150. There are maybe 30 or 40 I'm really pleased with. The rest, I think I wish I'd spent more time writing um, and I could have done them better. And there's no hurry. There really is no hurry to finish books. And you know that actually that some of them are writers you love most have not written anything like that number of books. The other thing you need, I have to say, is this. To write a lot of books, you have to be very old. <laughs> and I've been lucky so far. I'm touching wood here. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, with the last two or three minutes we've got left, I have to firstly thank you for sending in millions of these signed book plates. All I've right. Yes, my, my hand is a bit, a bit, bit tired. This hand is gone. <laughs> I bet it is. I bet it is. And um, we've got, to, I have to give a shout out to uh, Decorum Borough Council who have um, sponsored um, this event. Oh, so there's a load of um, books going to Decorum Schools, uh, copies of this including the signed book plate. So um, those are being sorted in the next two or three days and will be delivered um, in the next two or three days. Um, all other schools, I apologize, you're not part of that, but you can still get the books from, um, with signed book plates from us. Um, Michael, it's been an absolute joy. Um, I've got two, two, two minutes left, so I don't want to waste those. Let's pick a, a random question. Um, uh, did you want Warhorse to be made into a film? Was that sort of your idea uh, of it being made into a film, or did Spielberg contact um, you? Someone contacted me. This and is that, that's a getting to ask the question. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll tell you the story. It's quite funny. It's sometimes my children used to get very fed up with me because we work on these farms for city children down the road. We were working sometimes, you know, fifteen hours a day up and down the road with the children. And my own children used to get a bit fed up when the phone rang. They knew that was be one of us, my wife or myself, would disappear down the lane to do something with the project. And they get fed up. And so when the phone rang, um, one of them would say, oh, don't worry, Dad, it's just Spielberg again. <laughs> that was a family joke. And then one day it was. And when I actually turned around to them and said that was Spielberg on the phone, um, how shall I say? They were a tiny bit of surprise. No, I didn't plan any of this. Listen, I got, I've been so lucky. I mean, with Warhorse, the reason it ever became a Spielberg film is because it was first a play at the National Theatre with amazing, amazing puppets. You can Google them up, people. It's unbelievable puppets they were. And that was because there was someone who worked at the National Theatre whose grandfather had been in the First World War with horses, who heard about Warhorse because I talked about it on the radio with his mum, who was a doctor. And she said to, yeah, I've just heard this thing about Warhorse, and you, you must you want, you want to do a play, don't you, with some puppets? You told me about this, Tom. And Tom Morris, he was called. And he said, thanks, mum. And he went and read the book. And two years later, it was on the stage. Two years after that, Spielberg walks into the door of the theatre in London, sees the play, and wants to make a film. 
Life's like that. And you know perfectly well there's downsides and upsides. That was my big upside. I got lucky, that's all. Lovely. We've clicked through to um, 11.45. Um, Michael, thank you so much. Let me give a quick shout out to as many of the schools as I can read off. Aylesbury High watched it, uh, Boxmore Primary, Bridgewater, Byron Court, Micklem, uh, Bishop Wood, Brooklands, Cheddington, Hammond Academy, Edgerton, Rossay, uh, Pixies Hill, uh, St. Bart's in Wigginton, St. Mary's School, Horridge and Cholesbury again, Dundale, Par Parmeters, um, Wendover Junior, uh, Grove, Grove Road, uh, Abbots Hill, Long Marston. Sorry, the, the, the list is going on. But I'm Listen, gonna... that's wonderful. Can I say, Ben, thank you to all the schools for coming along and thank you in particular to the teachers for arranging it as well because i know these things take time so thank you to the children and the teachers of all schools and also to you ben for for setting it up um and because it, it it it's been a lovely occasion i just wish i could see people and talk to people rather than look at my little stupid screen well please come and visit us when the world is allowed so please come let's, to tring and we can arrange let's a do big that. event in a i'll come course. to tring and some of you come to the farm that would be lovely <laughs> Thank you so much for being Michael Morpurgo and thank you to all the schools and all the teachers and everyone who made this happen. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All the best.